What's up, NBA fans? Welcome to the NBA Outlet, presented by OTGBasketball.com. Make sure you follow OTG on Twitter at OTG Basketball. Also hit that subscribe button. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me tonight, Corey Waldron, Matt Chin, and Jonathan Ibrahim. What's up, fellas? What's going on? Doing a little salsa dance, ready to get some awards going up. Yeah, we need some special music to go along with the uh, awards ceremony. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting podcast, guys. Let's get on. We obviously have done our preview pods where all 30 teams are released right now. So tonight we're talking awards. Everybody's going to give their the picks. We're going to debate a little bit, but let's get started. First award, Rookie of the Year. Honestly, might be one of the hardest awards to pick. If you consider last year, Malcolm Brogdon won. I don't think anybody had him going into the season as the Rookie of the Year. Who's your pick for this year, Corey? I'm digressing. I know in the previous series I said Markel Fultz, but I'm rolling with Dennis Smith Jr. That's an interesting pick, Corey. Uh, I'm going to go with kind of the, <clears throat> the more, popular, uh, more popular pick, and I'm going to go with Lonzo Ball. So I really wanted to pick Milos Teodosic because I think it would be really funny to have a 30-year-old Rookie of the Year, but I couldn't convince myself that he has enough minutes, so uh, my guy is Dennis Smith as well. Dennis Smith Jr., Lonzo Ball. I'm going with the forgotten man. I'm going with Ben Simmons. Kind of forgot about him and going to the season. I think just watching him and the talent that he has around him, he's going to have a big year. You know, per his 36 minutes in preseason, he would have averaged close to a triple-double. Um, not that I care about those uh, PER 36 minute lines, but a uh, little fun fact. Yeah. There's just so many I mean, variables in, in Philadelphia right now. I'm just uh, curious to see how it's all going to work because I just have so many questions there. How Simmons is going to be shooting the ball? I mean, obviously we know he's going to distribute and, and average like I think at least seven assists a game. I think he'll be right there as a rookie. But uh, schematically, there are just so many questions for me in Philadelphia that I, I couldn't be convinced on Markel Fultz or Ben Simmons. One reason I feel really good about uh, Ben Simmons is after watching Joel Embiid last night, having a weapon like that, especially with Simmons playing at the four, I just think that's going to be matchup nightmares across the board. Yeah. And then having an elite shooter like J.J. Redick is another piece for him to have. And like you said, Watching, I mean, basing it off preseason, obviously Fultz wasn't playing yesterday. Simmons is going to be running the show a lot. So I just feel like the touches are there. And I, I think Philly really has a lot of talent. Obviously, this is a risky pick based on health because, you know, one of these guys goes down, it could kind of ruin everything. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, he looks like he's going to have a great season, but um, I, I just don't think that, A, he's going to be healthy enough to play all 82 games. And there are just too many young talents that are going to get touches this year in Philadelphia that I just don't think he'll get the opportunity that he needs to win rookie of the year. I think the reason why I like Dennis Smith over some of the other guys is is not just because I think the Mavericks are going to be more relevant than, than the Sixers and the Lakers and teams like the Magic, uh, but just the way he fits into their system. I think Nerlens is just the perfect uh, pick and roll, rim runner, lob catcher. And then Dirk spreading the floor when Dirk moves to the five. And just like that space offense with Rick Carlisle, I think his opportunity, Dennis Smith, like they know that J.J. Barea and Devin Harris are not the future. So Smith is obviously impressed a ton uh, throughout summer league and into the preseason. And I just think his opportunity is incredible. And he'll be up around 30 minutes a game, in my opinion. Yeah, no, exactly, Matt. That's the same reason. I mean, on the previous years, I picked Markel Fultz, and then after watching in preseason, um, I don't know. I just he looks. He's not as far along as I kind of thought he was going to be offensively, and he's just he's a young kid, so he's going to make too many mistakes, I think. But Dennis Smith Jr. in Dallas, I mean, there's some solid pieces around him still. You know, Harrison Barnes, Wesley Matthews. You know, I don't know how good Dallas will be standing wise. He'll be getting 30 minutes a game easily. And he'll have a night, like you know, a nightly night, a night to night basis where he'll be able to take over an offense. But Corey, don't you think having all those veterans around him is going to hurt his chances of winning the award? He's got a coach in Rick Carlisle who is not exactly <clears throat> the most rookie friend, friendly coach. He's going to be looking to win games, and with the roster with Dirk Nowitzki, um, Wesley Matthews, uh, Harry, yeah, yeah. The, these guys are all going to get touches as well. And I, I think this roster is a guy's. Uh, has a lot of guys with an ego that are they are going to be wanting to win games. So I, I just don't see and, – and, and don't forget Yogi Ferrell, who had a you know really surprising season last year. He's going to eat up some minutes as well. I, I just don't think he's going to have the opportunity uh, that he's, is necessary to make that big of an impact. I mean, yeah, I mean uh, – but, I mean, you can win Rookie of the Year on a successful team. I mean, a who, team I – mean, who's, who's won Rookie of the Year on a successful team, though? Malcolm Brogdon. 
But I mean, look what happened. Look what had to happen for Malcolm Brogdon to win that award. You know, Joel Embiid had to only play 30 games, and the uh, the only other you know real uh, you know threat to win the award was on Joel Embiid's team, so, who had his own injury issues, right? See, to me, I mean, yeah, he, he, to, to me, it's about minutes. So, and I just don't see anyone getting in Dennis Smith Jr.'s way to get to 30 minutes a game. That's why, like, I could never pick Jason Tatum to be bound to, like, minutes in the teens with, with the Celtics. I don't, I don't see a lot uh, of pushback at the, at the point guard position in terms of their depth chart. And they're, they're all in on Dennis Smith. I mean, they were ecstatic when New York passed on him and he fell into their laps. He's exactly who they were targeting. And I think he's proven that he's ready, uh, even though he'll have some growing warts. I think there's something to be said about playing on a, a somewhat competitive team. One more thing I want to add is uh, about the rookie of the year that's been on the team with veterans. Uh, Dame Lillard, his first year in Portland. That's but a I mean, good comparison. Again, we're talking about we're talking about one guy in the last what ten, maybe twelve years. Yeah. Like it's it's not a very likely scenario that a, a player surrounded by a bunch of veterans and talented players is going to have the 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 amount of the touches. And I, I mean, are we are we saying that Dennis Smith Jr. is going to have the talent level of a Damian Lillard? I just think his efficiency could be there because he's surrounded by so much talent. Like I look at what the Philadelphia 76ers have. I look at what the Lakers have and just their systems have so much room to grow. I think that Dennis Smith with Rick Carlisle, who's, who's in my opinion, still a top three coach in the NBA, he's going to put him in some advantageous positions. So yeah, Jonathan, I, I agree with you that you know, Wes Matthews, Harrison Barnes, they're going to get their looks, but I think, uh, I think that he's, that Dennis Smith Jr. is the one who's going to be kind of running the entire show because he's really the only pro only ball handler that they have in their starting lineup. Go with Lonzo over Dennis Smith Jr. Why do you think he's going to have the bigger year? I just kind of think the stage is set for Lonzo this season. <clears throat> he's had uh, he, you know he's had a a crazy roller coaster of a ride uh, off season to this point, but I think uh, once the regular season starts, he's going to have the ball in his hands a lot more than any of the other Lakers. Uh, he's surrounded by a lot of young players that <clears throat> have not really proven much. I mean, uh, Brandon Ingram was their big rookie from last season, and he was on such a short leash last year that uh, he didn't really get a, the opportunity to accomplish much. And I just think that the Lakers, especially with uh, you know bringing in Magic to the front office, I think that they're kind of all in on this kid. And, and, and he's the type of guy who, you know, he will step on the court and force people to watch his games. And when you have a talent like that, a box office talent like that, I think you kind of run him into the ground. You get him to play as much as possible. So barring injury, I think we're looking at a really, really promising season from Lonzo Ball. From an intangible standpoint, too, with Lonzo Ball, I mean, it really helps him to have the celebrity status to be the number two overall pick where people – kind of just think in their mind that the best rookies should be the ones who are picked in the top three. The Lakers have a ton of nationally televised games. Obviously, they have a huge following. So I think the attention that he gets is an intangible advantage uh, over some of the other guys. That, that's a great point. Just the fact that there's – I think they have like 45 national televised games. Yeah. That's, you know, that's 45 they, have more than the, they have more than the Celtics. Yeah, and it's 45 <laughs> more times than an entire nation can watch a player – um, play and I I agree, John, to the degree that Lonzo, being with the style of offense the Lakers are going to run, he's going to have a chance to showcase more by ways of facilitating, by controlling the offense. Because I'm not sure how Dennis Smith will be as a true running the offense type of point guard. I think he's going to be more of like a a <clears throat> excuse me a scoring type of guard. But you know, for me, Lonzo offensively, I don't know. I I'm still not sold on him being able to score, a you know, consistently. I think he can rebound decently. I think he'll be able to put up, you know, eight to nine assists this rookie year. But I mean, scoring wise, I just don't think he's that gifted. I think I think he's. You've got to give him more credit than that, though. I, I think he's not the most talented scorer on the <clears throat> on the list of rookies this year. You're right, but I think he's shown uh, flashes enough to at least be in double digits uh, his first year. I mean, maybe he maybe he will or maybe he won't get you know, close to that 10 assist mark. But um, I definitely uh, see him 10 points per game. And well, then, like you said, his rebounding numbers are going to be decent. His assist numbers, hopefully, uh, from what I from what I've seen, are going to be good. So I just think that given the amount of people, you know, ahead of your 
in the pecking order of the Mavericks offense, I don't think he's going to be getting more touches than Dirk Nowitzki, Harrison Barnes, uh, you know, Wesley Matthews, Nerlens Noel, even, you know, he's going to be sharing guard duties with JJ Barea, Yogi Ferrell, even Seth Curry. So I just think that there's a lot going on in that Mavericks team and it's going to hold them back a little bit. You know, I don't... Moving on from... Oh, go ahead, Corey. Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I'm... I think Lonzo will get, you know, 12 to 13 points per game. I just don't know how effective it'll be. You know, if he's shooting 35% from the field, I'm not sure how how much I care for that. I think his shooting and turnovers could be an issue. That'd be something I'd keep an eye on with Lonzo just to see what happens. But he he also has some nice pieces. He has a nice pick-and-roll partner with Brooke Lopez. You know, Ingram's probably going to take a step this year. We'll see how KCP does as a spot-up shooter. But moving on from Rookie of the Year, uh, Corey and Matt have Dennis Smith Jr., Jonathan has Lonzo Ball, and I have Ben Simmons. Let's talk most improved player. Who's winning most improved player this year? We just dropped the round table on this on OTG. Check that out as well. But here are our picks here. I'm going with the big fella, Miles Turner. Uh, I think this season the most improved player is going to be Yusuf Nurkic. If you follow me on Twitter, you know that I have an absolutely irrational obsession with Gary Harris. So Gary Harris is my pick. And I'm going to make my only time that I can ever make a homer pick or anything and have any bias. I don't think it's likely, but I just have to do it. I'm going to go with D'Angelo Russell. That's not a bad pick. I mean, I don't think that's that much of a homer pick. He's a, he's a great choice. I thought hard about him too. Like watching him in preseason, I just think he's more talented than I originally anticipated. So I'm looking for D'Lo to have a big year. And I know on the preview pod, I talked about him probably averaging under 20, and that's probably most likely. But I actually could see him averaging around 20 points this year. I wouldn't be surprised. He's going to shoot a ton of threes. I mean, someone has to take those field goal attempts from Brooke Lopez. And, and it has to be exactly. him. They're, I mean, he he is the foundational piece now uh, for Brooklyn. And I think getting Timofey Mozgov's contract as a price is a hefty price to pay. So, I mean, they're all in in terms of development around D'Angelo Russell. And also, moving the ball, he looked especially well this preseason, at least, moving the ball around. Passing, I think, yeah. Yeah, he, he surprised me with his pass. I think offensively, I kind of knew how good he was. But uh, playmaking-wise, he definitely showed me a lot. I mean, his he may not be a traditional <clears throat> point guard, but he's very good at moving the ball around. So, um, Matt, why do you think Gary Harris can win? I, I'm pretty high on Gary Harris, too, but how, how much of a jump do you think he's going to make this year? Yeah, so he was 14 points, two boards, two ass three assists, and a steal last game. I think, or last season, I think all of those numbers can come up a little bit. Uh, in my opinion, the system that Mike Malone finally realized halfway through the season that uh, Nikola Jokic should be playing the five around four spacey players and not playing conventional bigs next to Nikola Jokic, like. Mason Plumley and, and um, Kenneth Fareed. And now that they have Paul Millsap and more of a free-flowing offense, I think that's going to open all the doors for Harris. Uh, I was listening to Tim Connolly, the Nuggets GM on Woj's podcast, and he said that Harris's rapport with Jokic is unlike any other player on the team. Um, they read each other's minds and complement each other splendidly. Uh, Harris is coming off that huge contract, and I just I really love him as a two-way player. I think he's a, a good defensive player. I think he's an unbelievable cutter to the basket, and that um, and that extra spacing is really going to benefit him. So uh, I, I've been in on Gary Harris since they signed Paul Millsap. I think the only Gary thing Harris I worry is gonna about Gary, a really good year too. Yeah, Sorry, I think he's going to have a job. really good year good year and be efficient the only thing i worry about is like we know most improved players a little bit of a box score yeah word and i think you know having extra shots for a paul Millsap and then jamal murray's probably going to take a step this year i that's the only thing i'm concerned i think he's going to take a jump to possibly win the award but i don't know if his numbers would back it up yeah i, I just think that the the guard position in denver is so uh log jammed right now I don't know that there's enough room for Gary Harris to take a huge step forward, not to mention the fact that Jokic is going to demand more touches uh, as well as Millsap from their front court. <clears throat> so that all automatically eats away into some of the room where he had to grow. Add to the fact that you've got Jamal Murray, Will Barton, Jameer Nelson, Emmanuel Moutier, all playing backcourt positions. I don't know if there is a lot of space for him to grow this season. So I actually think Harris is going to play a fair amount of three just because we can't count on Wilson Chandler to keep an entire healthy season. And I think Will Barton is too 
slender to play the three, and I think uh, Hernan Gomez is more of a natural stretch four than a three. I mean, Harris is, like you guys have been saying, he's more of a two than a three, but I think he's going to get a fair amount of run on the wing just because their depth is, is so slim uh, in Denver. Wait, so I you can see think, that. You think, you think Will Barton's too small to play to play three, but you think Gary Harris is big enough? I think Will Barton's too skinny. I think Will, I think Gary Harris is actually stronger than Will Barton. I mean, Will Barton has a little bit more length, but the guy weighs like 125 pounds. Yeah, but I think <laughs> I think I think that would have been a big deal 20 years ago. But I think in 2017, I think that length and that height is more important than you know like the actual bulk because there's a lot less contact these days, right? And he's not going to be able to really guard. You know, guys that are six eight, six nine, and he's <clears throat> excuse me, and he's especially not going to be able to uh, to be very effective against longer, wider uh, defenders. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think Nurkic is going to win this year? You think he's going to just continue what he did at the end of last season, or I mean, did we not see some of the best basketball, uh, you know, from from the center position last year from this guy right here, Joseph Nurkic? He as soon as he made that trade to the uh to the trailblazers it was like all of a sudden <clears throat> you know the caterpillar became the butterfly like we got to see what this guy was really capable I and mean, it's, it's just a shame that he got hurt right at the end of the season because uh i was really looking forward to see what he would be able to accomplish in the playoffs but uh his numbers jumped up uh to about 15 16 points 10 rebounds uh he was shooting well from the field it really well with what the blazers were doing with their two uh stars in the backcourt uh mccollum and lillard uh, I like the way that they, the three of them played together. Uh, I just think that everything points to this guy having a great season. I think he's going to have lots of opportunity. I think the the front court in, uh, in Portland has been thin for a while. I, I don't think there's a lot of co- uh, competition there in terms of minutes or touches. So I think, uh, yeah, there, there's going to be a lot of uh, rebounds for him to get on the offensive side. I think there's a lot of touches for him in the, in the post that are going to be open for him. So uh, I think all the signs are pointing to him having a big year. I I gotta be honest, I first when I, this trade first went through I was I I wasn't a fan of it just because I, I thought Mason Plumlee did a lot of everything well nothing really good or great but he did everything well and I mean everything you just said was spot on Nurchik killed it I mean it, it, he he raised the question of did they did the Nuggets make the right move by trading you know Jojic at times because of how solid this guy was better than he was last year I don't know how much of a jump he'll take because he'll still always be third fiddle to uh, Lillard and McCollum. But I definitely think, I mean, down low in the, in the paint last year, he proved uh, when he's healthy, I mean, the guy can rebound, he can block a couple shots, and offensively he's got a few moves. Why do you think Miles Turner is going to win the award? Opportunity? Yeah, I mean, uh, similar to what we mentioned earlier on um, on a different pl- – I can't remember who. I forgot. <laughs> uh, Paul, Paul George is gone. So there's a ton of touches there from Miles Turner. Going to be the guy in Indiana now. There's no one else he has to defer to. You know, they're pretty much going to be giving him the keys to the offense. Larry Bird pump, even pumped him up uh, prior to this season in last year's offseason where he said that Miles Turner could be the greatest Indiana Pacer of all time. That's how good they think this wow. kid is going to be. And when you have Larry Legend speaking highly of you, you have your first chance to be the vocal point of an offense. He can now shoot threes more consistently than he did last year, so they say. Um, and it's another year of gaining IQ and learning how to play. I, I just think Miles Turner is bound to have a breakout season, despite the Pacers being probably mediocre at best. Do you think that the the guards in Indiana are good enough to be able to put him in a position where he can score a lot? Because I know one of the things, being a big, you kind of have to count on those guys to get you the ball to, you know, in your sweet spots and let you be able to let you go to work. For sure. I, I think Corey Joseph is more of a playmaking point guard in itself. I mean, Darren Coffey's kind of a gunner. Uh, but Lance Stevenson's going to have a lot of ball handling duties. And Lance Stevenson would rather pass than score, uh, despite how he can get a little bit happy with the ball in his hands. He's a guy who likes to give the rock and give assists. And I think because him and Miles Turner played together last year, um, I know they worked out several times this offseason together. Um, I think they're going to have a nice relationship on the court, and I think Miles Turner will be the beneficiary of a lot of good looks from both Corey Joseph and Lance Stevenson. Hey, Corey, I just want to be I just want to be completely uh, upfront with you. If you think Corey Joseph is going to be more of a playmaker, uh, coming from a Raptors fan, don't don't count on it, man. Don't count on it. He is gun happy. 
You, you think you you think he'll be gun happy in this system? I think so. I I mean the Raptors play a lot of ISO ball with their guards, but I I don't ever remember seeing much. Even even when he's playing for Team Canada, that there's not a whole lot of I'm gonna get the guys involved. I'm gonna run this. Uh, you know, I'm gonna run the plays. I'm gonna get the the. I'm gonna put the system first. He's definitely more of a shoot first guard, and um, whether or not he can make the adjustment to uh, to more of a pass first player, I'm sure he has the talent to do it. Uh, I just think, given the the lack of talent on this team, he's going to be looking for his first. Well, if that's the case scenario, then I don't want him playing. And that's, that's all I got. <laughs> um, I mean, they do need people to get buckets. So maybe if he's on the floor, they'll just have Lance Stevenson running the offense, which is something they've already thought about doing. So maybe he'll be more of a two guard just playing the point guard position and Lance will do ball handling duties. If, they, if he's going to be, you know, if they want him to even be a scoring type of guard. Most improved player, Corey's got Miles Turner, Jonathan's got Joseph Nurkic, uh, Matt's has uh, Gary Harris Jr., and I have D'Angelo Russell. Sixth man of the year, who you got? Oh, yeah, that's me, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm, I, I was on the – I had a different person coming on this podcast, but I can't pick two Pacers back-to-back -back in a row. <laughs> I feel like that is just completely <laughs> and utterly wrong of me to do. Um I had I really want to see Derrick Rose. So Derrick Rose. It's kind of it's I'm going with Derrick Rose, but it, you know, it's kinda of gonna be you know screwed up because he's gonna start, you know, majority of the season. I'm gonna say Derrick Rose because that's the guy I have so much faith in. Well, I'm gonna go you, with uh, a more conventional six man uh player. I'm, I'm gonna go with the guy who I think should have won it last season, and that's Lou Williams. I think it's time that we start uh, giving Andre Iguodala his credit. I mean, he doesn't score the same amount as, as some of the other guys, but uh, he's he's as important as anyone else off the bench to his team. So Iguodala is my guy. And on this one, I'm going with Lou Will. I think that he's going to need to score a lot for the Clippers, especially that guard position. Iguodala is a guy that I definitely consider, and like you said, he's probably the best bench player, the most important bench player off the bench. The only thing I worry about this year, I think the Warriors are going to rest him a little bit more. He has a little bit of back issue, and Patrick McCaw looks really good, so I think they're going to be okay giving him some more minutes and kind of resting Iggy till the playoffs start. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, my, my feeling with Iguodala is, and the, and the six-man award is so biased toward offensive players, players who just are volume sc scores, but I just... I really want to change. I really want to change the narrative on what a six man should be because I think Iguodala in their death lineup uh, when he comes on uh, for the center and they're just so versatile, so switchable. His playmaking, he has decent enough catch and shoot ability. He just does everything the right way for the Warriors, and it just seems to change the tempo and the momentum and the atmosphere of the game whenever he comes in. So, like, yeah, do I think there's a better chance of someone like Lou Williams or Gordon wins it? Uh, absolutely, but I think Andre Iguodala is as important to that Warriors death lineup as anyone is off the bench. Come on, uh, man. Come on, man. Go ahead, Jonathan. I averaged seven points a game last season. He averaged one yeah, well, three a game. Thing. It's not just but, about scoring, in my opinion, for in terms he of add, though. Role. What else does he add? What other than other than other than playing, you know, defense on you know, make on our he's a better defender. He's a better defender than anyone else we brought up in this conversation. And I still think defense should count for something. And if we're gonna, and but most the defensive come off, side of the ball is not as important as the offensive side of the ball. I mean, you get half the possessions. It's, it right? might not be as it might not be as important, but it's really about the role that you fill. And the Warriors already have volume scoring uh, on their team. They don't need someone to pour in 17 bench points a game on <laughs> two assists and two rebounds or or whatever Eric Gordon and Lou Williams are going to have. I just think that, yeah, Iguodala's offensive output, his statistics might not be there, but the ability for them to spread the floor – switch defensively between him with the three, four, and five, he can pretty much defend anyone. Um, I mean, obviously not in, in a huge capacity of minutes anymore, but I just love what his role is on the team. And I think uh, it's time that we start changing how we think about six men and, and who should win that award. Is it, is it safe to say that, that Andre Iguodala is the most important six man to his team, but maybe not the best six man in the league? I mean, no, yeah, that's, that's one way to say. That's, that's completely one way unfair to say. <laughs> no way. There's no way, guys. Come on. We're we're now we're now we're getting a little silly. 
we're getting a little silly. If 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 the Warriors if the Warriors lose Andre Iguodala, do you think they're sweating much? Really? Do you genuinely think? I mean, do you think, do you think the team loses in the finals? He's, Andre he's Iguodala a, goes down. Uh, no, not necessarily. No, of course. So not. how can he? How can he still be have the most the great, important? Well, you can say that, but he's the most six, important man. bench player. <laughs> he's not even the most because important when, bench player on the Warriors, man. Who is? What, who is? Sean Livingston is by far more important because of his ball oh, handling and shot making ability from the mid range. He creates nightmare ma- uh, matchup nightmares for every other team in the NBA because of his size at the point guard position and his ability to handle and and pass and make shots for you know create shots for himself. Who who else in the league does that other than maybe a select few guys? I mean, Iggy's a very good creator for that for that second unit. He rebounds very good. He's their best defender off the bench unit and probably their second or third best defender well no third best uh, probably fourth third. best defender now on the team because of Durant Dur- Draymond and Clay. but he's their best defensive player off the bench because he can guard two through four one through four I mean he can guard some point guards himself I sure think- but if he if, if you were to take his minutes and allocate them to Nick Young this season that team still wins a championship so I can't see how he's more important than a guy like um Yo, let's just use my example, uh, Lou Williams, who for the Clippers this season, he's probably going to average 16, 17 points a game. And without those 16, 17 points, that team isn't going to win nearly as many games. But on the flip side, what else does Lou Williams do other than give you 16 points a game? I mean, he's not passing the ball much. He's not doing – he's not defending – much. I just feel like when they bring Igudala in, it gets the crowd going. And when they have that – uh, that lineup, the death lineup, it's basically unguardable and unpenetrable on the other side. So when you but, have, but that's not because of Andre Iguodala. That's because of the other four guys on the court. Right? I think Iguodala, I think Iguodala is a huge part of it. I think there's about 50 players in the league you could replace Iguodala with, and that line, that that, that death well, lineup is just as effective. Because well, they disagree see- because they paid him. <laughs> Right, they paid him. They paid him. It was kind of more of a keeping the guys together. He's one of Steph Curry's best friends. There's, there's other reasons why they paid him, but there are a bunch of guys in the league that if they were put in Andre Iguodala's position over the last two years, they would have been just as successful. I disagree. I think, I think, I think, I think the, Iguodala is one of the best 3 and D players in the NBA. I, based off what? Based off what he did three, four years ago? Just because of his versatility and what he's what he's been doing every single time. I mean, that, that lineup... When they have men, yeah, he might be the fifth. He might be the fifth element, but it makes them so different versus when they have Javale McGee, traditional centers in there. It just makes the matchups an absolute nightmare for opposing coaches. But what I'm saying is, you could put a whole list of other players in that same position, and they'll be just as effective. Are you telling me Trevor Ariza wouldn't be just as effective in that position, if not better than Andre Iguodala? He might be he's younger, if Trevor, maybe. If Trevor Ariza was on that team, nice. I think one thing that you're underrating about Andre Iguodala, I, I think you know he probably is replaceable, but I think he has a really high basketball IQ, and I think the fact that he's willing to accept his role and do the small things, a lot of hockey assists. I think you could replace him. I wouldn't say with 50 players. I think the list would be a lot smaller and probably 15 or less. He, you know, the arguments from both sides were, you know, Iguodala doesn't necessarily have to do a lot for the Warriors, but that doesn't take away from him being, you know, a high-quality role player. But I would He's not my pick personally for six-man. I'm going with Lou Will just because I think production's a big thing for this. And like you said, you know, you lose Iggy, the Warriors are still going to win. But let's not let Corey off easy on this one. He picked Derrick Rose, so I want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, first I had Lance Stevenson, but uh, yeah, I picked Derrick Rose. I don't know. I, I don't guess, know. I don't. I guess I read the storyline. Uh, I guess I'm too much in the storylines. I, I just everything he said so far, and I watched the preseason game the other night where the Cavs played. Um, yeah, they played a team, and I watched it. a team. <laughs> uh, it was on TV. I was on ESPN. Chicago. 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 Thank you. There's no one worthy worthy to talk about Chicago, so I just forget that they even exist. Um, but no, I he, love Jerry. He looks good. Come on. Oh, yeah. And uh, Felicio or Feliciano, <laughs> whatever the hell his name is. Um, he's He looks good. I mean, he, he doesn't look to be trying to do too much early on. At least I know it's preseason. Like, I, I'm not trying to base it all preseason. But, you know, he looks to be – more in control of himself. It seems to be that he's adjusted to his body. I don't see him going for dunks anymore. He he just goes for the layups that he can do because he's so uh, elusive while he's driving. He gave a couple oops to um, Jeff Green 
and he, he was throwing the ball around the court, like looking for the open man very well. He did a couple uh, driving, um, driving dishes. I, I just, I don't know. I liked what I saw. And I think, you know, Cleveland obviously is another one of those teams similar to the Iggy and Warriors document uh, conversation. If you lose Rose off this Cavs team, they're probably still going to be the best team in the East. But I just think he gives them a different dynamic off the bench because you need someone who can come off the bench and give you some quick buckets. And I think if Rose accepts that when he gets that role, when Isaiah Thomas comes back, I mean, you know, this is a guy who not many people have someone who can guard him off the bench. I will say this for Derrick Rose. I mean, he's going to be starting at least until Isaiah Thomas comes back. So if he is able to qualify for sixth man, if Thomas comes back and is able to to finish out the season, uh, Rose is – End of, end of season statistics might be pretty high because he had half the year to be in a starting role. Yeah, but I think, I think voters will hold that against him. Yeah, that could be true, too. I, I think so as well, most likely. Yeah, Does think- Derrick Rose look slimmer to you guys? Uh, I think everyone looks slimmer in these Nike uniforms. I, true, I, true. I, 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 there's this huge list of players that, like, are, they tell you they have lost all this weight, but I just think the Nike uniforms are slimming down everyone. With the weird back. That'd be true. I mean, they are but, pretty yeah, I mean, but Derek Rose looked, uh, and I was watching that Bulls game too. He looked fast with the ball when he took it coast to coast. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not ready to say that he, he's ready to win a six man uh, award because I think eventually, in my ideal mind, that'll be Dwayne Wade, who's the sixth man off the bench. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a very creative pick from Corey. Something a little different, but moving on from six man, Corey's got Derrick Rose, Jonathan's got Lou Will, I got Lou Will, and Matt has Andre Iguodala. Defensive player of the year. Who you got, Corey? Rudy Gobert. I got the same guy, Rudy Gobert. Oh man, I hate to agree with everyone, but I'm going with Gobert as well. I'm gonna be different. I'm going with Draymond yeah. Green, Jonathan's Good. favorite player. Um <laughs> One thing for Rudy Gobert, I think he's going to have to actually do more offensively this year, and it could be a little bit more tiring just because he won't have his good pieces around him. And I think Draymond, he has the luxury of, you know, he doesn't really have to do a ton offensively, and he's just going to go out there and defend multiple positions, and the Warriors are probably going to have, you know, top three defensive rating once again. I'm just biased toward newbies. I I look at Draymond Green, and we know what he is, and I just think if Utah is able to make it to the postseason – uh, after losing Gordon Hayward, it's going to be on the back of their defense, and the anchor of that defense is Rudy Gobert. Uh, 6.2 defensive real plus minus, uh, real plus minus last year, which is like absolutely insane, way ahead of any other center in the league. And I just think Rudy is the kind of player who, because there are plenty of guys who are good rim protectors, and then there are players who force teams to play differently when they're around the basket. And Gobert is the pinnacle of that to me. So I think Utah still makes it into the playoffs. I think they have a top three defense. I think they have an atrocious offense. Uh, But it's going to be on the back of Rudy Gobert, and I I hope that the voters don't overlook that. I mean, I watched the uh, Lakers Jazz game the other night, and, man, uh, I really liked the addition of Ricky Rubio. I think he was the perfect point guard to bring in to uh, boost up a guy like Rudy Gobert because he really gave him a nice, a lot of easy looks the other night against the Lakers. I think it's going to be a, a, something we see on a nightly basis for Utah. Yeah, actually, the addition of uh, Rubio is the reason why I went with uh, Gobert. Initially, I had, I had three guys that was kind of, I'd narrowed it down to Gobert being one of them and the other two being Hassan Whiteside and uh, Draymond Green. Draymond Green more so because the Defensive Player of the Year tends to be a forgotten award. And typically, to come the end of the season, people kind of go, oh, that's right. I got to give this award to somebody. Uh, who won it last year? Yeah, we'll give it to them. Because if you look back at it, there are, you know, no other award has as many repeat winners as yeah. the Defensive Player of the Year. So I think, I think that bodes well for Green. But with, with Rudy Gobert, I think in order for the Jazz team to even be remotely successful this season, it's gonna have, they're going to have to hang their hat on their defense. And I think Rudy... <clears throat> Sorry, not Ru- uh, Rubio at the point guard position. Like, he's an extremely underrated defender, and I think that uh, I think that Rudy's going to be able to benefit from that. The team's going to look really good defensively. They're probably going to have a top five, you know, at least top ten defense. So I, I, I think Gobert is going to get a lot of credit for that, and that's why I think he's going to win. I, here's what I'll say about Draymond. I think stylistically, where the NBA is going, we look at players like Draymond as. as kind of the optimal defender because he can switch along the perimeter, guard multiple positions. But Gobert can turn away anyone in the paint, one through five. doesn't matter if you're driving. doesn't matter if you're 
um, in the post up against him. He, I mean, he, he altered shot right everywhere. Yeah, it's true. So, I mean, yeah, does Gobert switch along the perimeter like what we're looking for in kind of a modern defender, elite defender? No, but he changes the most important part uh, of the defensive part of, uh, of the scheme, and that's right at the rim. Um, I th- I read somewhere that he gave up something like 42% uh, uh, to opponents' field goal percentage in the paint, which is absolutely insane. Do you guys think that um, the Jazz have to make the playoffs for Gobert to win the award? Yes. I don't, personally. I, I, but I think, they, I think they need to be close to that, that, that eighth seed. I mean, if they're, if they're the worst team in the Western Conference, then there's, obviously there's, there's no chance for them. But I think if they're close to that eighth seed, um, I, th- I think he still has a good shot, provided that he plays outstandingly well. And they're, you know, despite a poor record, they're still a top defensive team in the league. I think the only way that they get the notor- that he gets the notoriety is if the Jazz defense is just so incredible that it that it carries them to the playoffs. Because I don't believe in Rodney Hood to become like this twenty point per game scorer that people are talking about. And the Jazz are now without Gordon Hayward being back to that prototypical small market team that everyone overlooks, never on national TV, don't get a lot of attention uh, in the internet. So. I think for Gobert to get the recognition that he needs from the voters, they're going to have to carry. He's going to have to carry them to the playoffs on the defensive side of the ball. That will be a big impact for Gobert. It's the fact that if he's able to kind of get the national attention for the Jazz to make the playoffs, it'll definitely help his case. We know Draymond's going to get plenty of attention because he's going to be in a ton of national televised games. But next award, you know, Corey, Matt. Hold on, and- hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I can't, I can't move to the next part of the podcast without talking a little bit more about Draymond Green. <laughs> he is the most overrated defensive player in the NBA. Oh, whoa. Wildly overrated. Wildly overrated. Right? He makes boneheaded gambles on the defensive end on a, on a regular basis, and it gets covered up by that team consistently. The, the Warriors aren't that great of a defensive team. They have a lot of length. They make things difficult. But they were one of the worst defensive teams, just just purely going off defensive rating last season. They were one of the worst teams in the league. And we're talking about a team that has... Defensive rating was one of the top in the league last year, the Warriors. Based off of defensive rating? Defensive rating, they're one of the top ones. Oh, I don't know what I was looking at then. But regardless, I I just... He he makes boneheaded... He makes boneheaded plays consistently on that that end of the floor, and it gets covered up by... A, the fact that they win a lot of games, and B, he has some you know big moments because he's asked a lot to do a lot at that side of the court. I just think he's an overrated defensive player, and because of his role and his fit with this team, he gets a lot of credit where I think if he was in a different situation, he wouldn't get that credit. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find players who can shut down people like Green does two through five. But I, I just don't think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a team effort. That 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 the way that team I mean, is. It's true. I mean, Clay Thompson so, is an elite defender. Kevin Durant it, it had his best defensive year of the season. Obviously, someone like Andre Iguodala is a great defensive player as well. But I see where you're coming from a little Draymond bit. Draymond also Draymond also makes that defense great though. He's he's a great help defender himself. Yeah, he does take gambles, but that's also kind of the way they play. Like he's always there to help Steph when he's you know lost or somebody gets beat or they have somebody else in. And like Matt said, you know find a player of his caliber to defend multiple positions. Obviously, he's a great fit in the Warriors. In another system, he might not be. But in this system, I think he's a great fit, and he allows for that versatility in the small ball with what he can do offensively, and then you can plug him in anywhere on defense, and he's going to probably give you most guys in the league. I, I get that. I'm, I'm not saying that Draymond's not a good defensive player. I'm just saying that he's, he's, he's overrated. And what I mean by that is if you were to take him and put him on another, you know, kind of – middle of the table uh, playoff team, are they going to get, you know, miles better defensively? Are the Warriors really going to get that much worse defensively? I don't think so. I mean, we saw how I think the Warriors would get worse defensively. But I think they would. I mean, how much worse are they going to get, though? Because we saw that a guy like Kevin Durant, who isn't known for his defense, can walk into that team and all of a sudden have the best defensive season of his career. Okay, hypothetically, let's go to the seasons before Kevin Durant was there. If you take Draymond off those teams, they're probably not going to the finals. I disagree with that, but it depends who you replace them with. If you if you take them if you take them off and don't give and don't don't give them a kind of comparable player, yeah. But I mean, it's like saying, well, if if Kyrie wasn't on the Cavs, they don't go to the finals. But you're saying defensively he wouldn't change a team. But I'm saying Draymond's I'm one saying, of the reasons they play great defense. 
He's but one I'm of the saying, reasons the Warriors are a great defensive system, and they have that piece. So you can't say he wouldn't play good defense elsewhere because you don't know how he would play. You're saying he gambles, but that's kind of part of how they react on I'm not. Defense. I'm not saying he wouldn't play good defense on another team. I'm saying if you take Draymond just by himself and put him on, let's say, the Rockets last season, I don't think the Rockets become one of the top defensive teams in the league. I think they get slightly better defensively. Uh, but, but I, okay, I just you put LeBron I, I don't on the Rockets. That, you put LeBron on the Rockets or Rudy Gobert, like not going to play good defense. I mean, I see well, where but, Jonathan's you know, coming from. Uh, from a team defense perspective, it needs to work like a machine, right? Everyone has to run their role, and and there are a lot of great defenders in Golden State. But I think that he's just so unique with his length and his foot speed and his strength defending in the post that he just has such a wide variety of defensive skills that I think he can be uh, kind of unleashed in a, a multitude of different ways. And that's his versatility is really what makes him such an elite defender. I, mean, I guess we'll, we'll just have to agree play... to... Sorry, go ahead. Would you replace Draymond with on the Warriors that you think could supply the same defense at that position? That's Why? but that's, that's specifically <laughs> what I'm trying to say. It's, it's what he does very, very uniquely that makes the Warriors what, what they are. But I'm saying that that, in terms of being the best defensive player in the league, I think you should have a universal talent. Like, you should like – to- the fact that Tony Allen hasn't won a Defensive Player of the Year award is a crime because he is the, by far the best perimeter defender in the NBA and has been for a long time. But he doesn't but we- ne- necessarily fit into that, 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 oh, well, he, you know, he makes a lot of uh, difference for this team because he can kind of focus in on this one aspect of the defense. Right? We, we forget that guys like Clay Thompson are, is an elite defender. Kevin Durant has become an elite defender. They've played with a you know a, a defensive minded center for you know Andrew Bogut for example, elite defender. Uh, Zaza Pachulia is an, a great you know defensive player to have at the center position. We forget that the Warriors have all these defensive players, and that's what makes the machine work. And then yeah, you've got a you've got a good defender to kind of plug in, who's versatile, has a lot of length, and can guard three positions. But what I'm saying is that is that enough to be considered the, the defensive player of the year? And in my opinion, I, I don't think so. He's the person that allows them to play defense the way they do. Yeah, they have elite defenders, but they weren't all there at the same time. draymond has been playing good defense for years. And, I mean, you could make the same argument about the Jazz. Like, Rudy Gobert, other good defenders around him. You know, Gordon Hayward wasn't a bad defender. George Hill isn't a bad defender. Rodney Hood isn't a bad defender. This year, they're going to have Tabo Cephalosha. There's other guys that can play defense there. So, I think any year, if you're going to be defensive player of the year, you're playing on a good defense with other good defenders. I mean, the Spurs... Defense isn't, isn't just because of Kawhi. No, but we can I, we can single Kawhi say, out as Kawhi is by far and away the best defensive player on that team. And then if you put him on any other team, he's going to be by far and away the best defensive player on that team. I just don't think you can say the same thing about about, about Draymond. To the one point, I mean, I only two. I just want to make one point. You know, you, you mentioned how Draymond takes you know a lot of chances and does at times you know a lot of bonehead things on defense, but you know from him because offensively you don't want Draymond to do anything more than what he does now because you have Durant to where Draymond can make the biggest impact on the court is by doing anything he can possibly on defense and sometimes it revol- it results in a bad reach or a or a bad or a misassignment because he's trying to do too much on times in the defensive end which I'll admit he does at times but I think that's also what makes him so special is the fact that he can go all out on the defensive end without regulation and I think we haven't even mentioned he is a tough dude. He has extra leadership. How many guys that are sub six nine are going to be playing in the center position, banging with guys down low and actually, you know, shutting them down? But enough about defensive player of the year. Let's move on to our next award. You know, you you three have Rudy Gobert, I had Draymond Green. Here, who you got, Corey? All right. So for me, I'm rolling with uh, the once Gator head coach Billy Donovan. Um, I'm rolling with the OKC Thunder head coach. I think this season I'm, I'm, I wanted to go with Brad Stevens, um, but I think if he, if he wasn't going to win it last season, I don't know if he'll win it this season. I think Eric Spolster is going to win it this year. So this is where my one bias pick comes out. I am picking Bradley Kent Stevens. <laughs> It's, so for these last two awards, I didn't make a pick, and I want you guys to convince me who my pick should be. Oh, well, you're going to have to make a pick at some point. We're going to look back the at end, this, I'm and we're going to hold it against each other. Well, you're going to convince me, and whoever gives the best case, I'm going to agree with them and make the pick. All right. Oh, wow. 
Unless you want to go Kenny Atkinson. <laughs> Um, all right, so let me let me pitch you to Billy Donovan. All right, pull up the okay. chair here, Nick. Sit on my lap. Let me give you a little lesson here. Um, first off, they have the executive of the year as well. I'm not, I'm not sure if we're talking about that award, but I think Sam Presti is the executive of the year as well um, for what he's done this past offseason and why I think they'll continue to do this season. Um, they brought in Paul George. I agree with that. They brought in Carmelo Anthony. They extended – Russell Westbrook. They brought in Raymond Felton. They brought in Patrick Peterson. Um, this is the first time that Billy Donovan is getting more. I mean, he obviously had Kevin Durant, and Russell Westbrook, but we know that was a flawed pairing. A ton of isolation, a ton of your turn, my turn, back and forth. He'll be able to, I think, especially because so far Mello looks like he's going to be Team USA Mello and take kind of a back seat and play more of the, you know, I'll shoot when I need to and pass the ball around more. Thus far. I mean, Westbrook still looks like he's going to try and uh, take on the entire other team at times. Uh, I think Paul George will be a great off-ball player. And I just think OKC is going to thrive. I know they have this ability where if Westbrook actually needs to take uh, 10 minutes off in a game, they can finally do that, where last year they couldn't. You know, in the fi- series against Houston, uh, Westbrook couldn't sit off the court for more than three minutes without them losing the lead or you know, going down by five points or going down by 10 points. That's just how much of a swing that and how bad, you know, his supporting cast was. And now Paul George can stay out there while, you know, Westbrook and Mello rest or vice versa. Mello can stay out there when George and Russ West. You know, I think they have a lot of um, flexibility in their rotations this year. And adding a guy like Patrick Patterson, they have their chance to have their own death lineup. You can put out a lineup out there when you have Patrick Patterson, uh, I'm not, Steven Adams, Patterson, Mello, uh, George, Wet, R- Russell Westbrook. You can even play Patterson at the center. Felton is a good – is you know, he's got the ultimate dad bot, but him coming off the bench. I think Billy Donovan will have the best uh, the best team on paper to put together a Coach of the Year uh, resume. Who's next? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go next. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just putting together my argument here. I didn't know I was showing up to uh... – to a debate, but here we go. Okay, it's courthouse. It's a courthouse. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think I'm ready to make my case. So, last season, the most unlikely stories was well, one of the most unlikely stories was how well the Miami Heat played uh, throughout the season and and almost actually clinched the playoff spot. Now, given their roster, uh, one has to ask, you know, how could something like that happen? And I think the main reason was the coaching uh, behind the Miami Heat. Uh, we heard it all year long. Eric Spolstra is, is arguably the best motivator in the game. Uh, he gets the best out of his players. He, you know, Dion Waiters was, you know, fighting for a spot in the league before the season started, and now he's he signed a multi million dollar contract. He got a ton of that uh, <clears throat> last season, and I think one of the main reasons behind that was Eric Spolstra and his ability to kind of instill confidence in his players and put them in the best position to succeed. Uh, guys like Hassan Whiteside, what they were able to accomplish before and after Spolstra is is, is mind blowing. Uh, same thing with uh, with with Waiters. It, it's he just has the ability to bring the absolute best out of players, and we saw that with guys like James Johnson, Derek Williams as well. I think this season, given how weak the Eastern Conference is, this gives the Miami Heat the opportunity to finish what they started last season, and that's clinch a playoff berth with arguably one of the, you know, less talented teams that'll be in the playoffs. I, I think there's not really anybody who stands out to me on that roster as a, as a great player. I still think Deion Waiters is trash. I think Hassan Whiteside is, is a great player, a great talent, but I don't think mentally um, he's strong enough to lead a team. Uh, Goran Dragic is a good player, but he's not great. I, I think they've got a lot of uh, bits and pieces that I think Spolster is going to pull together and he's going to, build this team into a, a, you know, not a, not a great team, but a playoff team. And it wouldn't be the, fr- so I, I, I guess my argument here, Nick, when it would be that it's, it wouldn't be the first time Spolster has been able to do this. I'll take you on a little history lesson. I'm going to take you all the way back to ni- uh, 2009, 2010 season when the Miami heat still had Dwayne Wade. Um, I want to talk you, I want to walk you through that roster. So that roster had uh, guys like Ray for Alston, Carlos Arroyo, Michael Beasley, Mario Chalmers, uh, Udonis Haslam, Jermaine O'Neal, Quentin Richardson, Dwayne Wade, and Darrell Wright. Uh, one thing about that season that you might remember is that 
the, uh, the Miami Heat struggled to keep players on the floor. Everybody was coming towards the end of their contract because uh, Pat Riley had, you know, big plans to sign, you know, LeBron James and Chris Bosh in the offseason. So they were shedding a lot of their contracts. They pulled in a lot of guys from different teams just to be able to make that work that see offseason before. So a lot of these guys hadn't played together before. And he managed to take that team all the way to the playoffs. They were the third uh, best team in the Southeast Division. They finished 47 and 35. The guys couldn't stay on the court long enough. They were pulling in guys, free agents, randomly throughout the season just to fill in roster spots. There was a game, I think they had three bench players or something like that, and somehow they still managed to make it to the playoffs. Unfortunately, they lost against the, the Boston Celtics in the first round, but they were even able to pull a game away from Boston. They finished that series losing 4-1. But I, that's the type of guy we're talking about in Eric Spolstra, and that's the guy I think is going to win Coach of the Year. So <clears throat> there's been no team that has had as much turnover as the Celtics since they blew it up in 2012. They virtually had a different roster every single season. Uh, but since Brad Stevens has gone there, been there 25 wins, 40 wins, 48 wins last year, 53 wins. I think the MO on Brad Stevens now is that uh, outside of Al Horford and, and some of the Celtics lottery draft picks the last couple of years, they've acquired guys that are misfits and castoffs and turned them into complete gold. Well, I won't say complete gold, but they've really maximized the talent. And that begins with Isaiah Thomas, who was a castoff from Phoenix. No one believed in him. Evan Turner, when he came to the Celtics, no one really thought that he could be um, a productive player, and he ended up signing an $80 million contract after he left of Boston. Jonas Jerebko, Gerald Green, he gave, uh, Brad Stevens gave life back into those players. He maximized Jay Crowder, who was a complete throw-in in the Dallas deal. Uh, the Mavericks didn't even care about throwing Jay Crowder in at that point. So I think Brad Stevens has proven over the course of the last four years that he is really, really amazing at scheming up players or scheming up his team so he can maximize players' talents and hide some of their deficiencies. Now, you're giving him bona fide top-tier scores and top-tier two-way – or I won't say top-tier two-way players, but um, you know, top 20 players in Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving. And look, maybe Isaiah Thomas is – on that level, maybe he isn't, where it's kind of to be seen whether or not he can replicate it. But I think with the amount of talent that this Celtics team has, uh, Brad Stevens is going to reach an entire new level as long as everyone buys in. And everyone has bought in uh, before, I think, uh, with Al Horford now being relegated to that third superstar role where he could be more of a facilitator, uh, more of a floor spacer. I think uh, the way that the Celtics have played so far in the preseason, you see that the adjustment period is not going to be as big as people might think. And objectively, what's working in Brad Stevens' favor is that everyone knows that the Celtics have – uh, more turnover than any other top-tier team in the league. So if they can take off running and Brad Stevens is able to incorporate all the new pieces um, really quickly, and by the time we get to Thanksgiving or Christmas, this team is sitting atop the East, uh, I don't think there will be another coach that can have that kind of resume with all these moving pieces, the expectations that the Celtics have to compete for an Eastern Conference championship, but also develop their young uh young developmental pieces and Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Like those are two contradicting ideologies to give 19-year-old uh, guys, 18-year-old guys minutes, meaningful minutes, but also try to build a, a team that's going to be uh, a juggernaut and one that that is uh, going to be a contender for the NBA Finals. So I think Brad Stevens has uh, on paper the biggest challenge in front of him, and I think he's going to be up for that challenge, and the voters are not going to ignore it. Matt does have a little advantage, Matt. You're a lawyer in real life, right? I am. Yeah, so he definitely had his case planned out. But um, you all made great cases. Oh, I had cases. nothing written down. That was off the top of the top of the dome. <laughs> That's how much I, mean, I love just, you know, Stevens, you know, man. Yeah, doing that before. But, you know, great cases, guys. I mean, everybody has their pros and cons. You look at OKC, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for Billy Donovan. They can be a lot better. But are these pieces going to work? He did get a lot of talent. Obviously, they should improve. Then you look at Miami Heat, like you said, Jonathan. You know, Spolstra is one of the best coaches in the league. There's no doubt about that. He got this team to play really well after being terrible in the first half of the season. And going back, like you said, to 2009, he definitely can get a lot out of his guys. But 
I just worry about the Heat. Are they going to, you know, be a good enough team this year to really get that award? Six. I think you you hit it on the head. You know, Brad Stevens does a great job developing guys and also scheming on the court is amazing. You know, I think LeBron said it once that he was one of the hardest defenses to prepare for. I mean, one of the hardest offenses to defend because of all the movement they have. But then you also look at the Celtics, like, you know, are they going to improve off of last season? Are they going to be a number one seed again, or is that for the Cavs? Before I make my pick, I got to ask you guys, how much do you think the previous season has on Coach of the Year? I think – Past winners has an impact. I mean, I don't have the the statistical data to back it up, but I, I just sense an inherent bias amongst the voters that people who haven't won before are more likely to win it uh, for the first time. And that goes across all of the NBA awards, in my opinion. I mean, last year, if we are going up last year, I, I picked Quinn Snyder to win. And I thought Eric Spolster and Brad Stevens would have been second and third for me because of what Brad Stevens did. With obviously that, you know, bunch of mis not misfits, but you know, everyone was slept on that team a lot last year. And then uh, for Miami, I mean, Eric Sprosa, you know, eleven and thirty-one to thirty-one and eleven. I mean, turnarounds like that don't happen often. I, I think, to your credit, Matt, I, I think Brad Stevens is one of the top three coaches in the NBA. I think he's of the three guys we're talking about. I think he is the best coach. I just think that. He, I, I actually think he deserved to win over Mike D'Antoni last season. Well, Mike D'Antoni that's, only coached one side of the floor last season, so <laughs> that's my I, I agree. I 100% agree, and I, and I think, I think that um, Brad Stevens was a little bit robbed. Um, but, again, that, that doesn't matter. That's just my opinion from last season. I, I think this season, though, what people look for in this award is that kind of outlier, that, that surprise factor, right? Uh, Mike Budenholzer, when they won 60 games with the Hawks, that jumped out at you. Um, George Carl, when he had his great season with the Denver Nuggets a few years ago uh, and they made it to the Western Conference Finals, that jumps out to you. Um, Sam Mitchell, when the Raptors finally kind of crawled out, out of obscurity and, and, and um, you know clinched that third seed in the Eastern Conference, that, again, stood out a lot. A lot of other times, they just kind of seemed to go with the – you know, a team that did well and, you know, an, you know, argue, an un unarguable uh, great coach like Greg Popovich or Tom Thibodeau. But I think this season, I, I genuinely think because of how poor and, and, and just how weak the Eastern Conference is, I think the Miami Heat are at least a five seed in that conference. And I think that that's what's going to surprise a lot of people. I don't think a lot of people have the Miami Heat high on their projection boards. I think they're going to win a lot more games than people expect. And I think people are going to be surprised by it, and that's what's going to win Alex Bolton at a work. So, so at least a five seed. Do you have them better than the Bucks, the Raptors, the Wizards? Who do you who do you have them better than? I definitely, I definitely have them better than the Bucks. I, I think, I, th I think he'll be better than the Bucks. I think the Bucks are going to be disappointing this season. <laughs> yeah, that's a hot take. That's a hot ass take. Uh, I mean, um, I, I, I think. If, if Deion Waiters hadn't gone down last season, I, I think they for sure would have been in the playoffs. And I think you got to take into consideration the fact that they had a horrible start. I agree. I, I, I we said, I said, we, Matt, you were on the, the Miami Heat preview pod with us, weren't you? I was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so you were, was, you were high on them. Yes. I was I'm, low. I'm, I'm yeah. I'm very high on Miami. I, I, for the same point, you know, they had a lot of injuries last year. Deion Waiters missed time. Josh missed some, some time. Justice Winslow wasn't there. Josh Richardson went down. Uh, Tyler Johnson missed some time. I mean, almost, you know, half their roster missed some time last year. You know, Luke Babbitt had to play 44 games or whatever it was. Mick Roberts. So I, I, yeah. yeah, I yeah, I agree that Miami's going to be a lot better than last year. I don't know if they're better than the Bucs. You know, the Bucs would really, for me, have to stagger. And Giannis would have to, to really uh, stumble in his progress for them not to be at, an, at least five or a six seed, I think, in the, the East. I think Miami's right around that seven to five range. I don't know if they get five. I think five is obviously the best case scenario. But I definitely think they're going to be in the playoff discussion because I said this on the preview podcast. I don't think they lose much momentum from the end of last year coming into this year. If anything, I think adding Kelly Olynyk, they they pretty much coast in with a little bit more chemistry than last year. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I think about when I think of the Heat, obviously there was a reason they went, uh, you know, 11-30 or whatever in the first half of the season and then did so well in the second half. You know, obviously they're going to be more somewhat in the middle. I don't think they'll be able to play at that level. They also just had some type of swag 
So I think that would be my concern with the Heat. How high are they going to be in the standings? And will people hold that against them that the Eastern Conference is weak in the East? Brad Stevens, the one thing I think with the Celtics that is going to hold them back is, you know, people are going to look at it and they're going to be like, well, they got all these players and they're going to not have as good a record probably as last season or they're not going to have the first seed. Them, I'm going to go with Corey. I'm going to take the risky pick and go with my guy, my co-host, Billy Donovan. And I think that uh, I think he's going to get it to work in OKC and they're going to have a pretty smooth season. Wow. I'm, probably. I'm honored. <laughs> so. Well, let's thank Sir, everyone vetoed, who came here. Vetoed, I was, he vetoed my trade today in fantasy, so I'm showing love even after that. Damn. I'm going to have to bake you a cake. <laughs> I think a huge part but, of the, but on, your thing is uh, the expectations and what people see in terms of how much adjustment needs to be made. And what Billy Donovan has is a huge amount of managing egos and managing superstars that have never had to, other than Russ, had to play with someone else who's of their caliber. So... Billy Donovan definitely has that going for him. I would say Billy Donovan probably is the worst coach out of the three we mentioned, but I think just in terms of improvement on the situation, like you said, managing the egos, and I think expectations, if they end up finishing with, you know, a top three seed in the West, I think people will be surprised. Where so, you know, Miami, if they end up higher than six, then I think people will be surprised. But if they end up at six, then I don't think people will be like, you know what, the East kind of sucks. Same thing with the Celtics, you know, like, the East isn't really good. They were a first seed last year. They're going to probably be a first or second seed. One thing that could really help Brad Stevens, though, in his case, I think would be if Kyrie did, you know, just turned into this true point guard. And just He's a lot more like so far. So, I mean, that could be the deciding factor right there. I mean, the deciding factor could be the star players. You know, the Kyrie Irving, Gordon Hayward's fit in Boston or Paul George and Carmelo Anthony's fit in OKC. Whoever works out a little bit more could end up helping the coach. For our next case, MVP, who do you got? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going with LeBron James. <laughs> uh, shouldn't come to, to too much of a surprise to you guys, but I'm going with LeBron as well. So unless the Spurs are hiding something from us that's going to keep Kawhi out until like December or something, I think Kawhi uh, takes it this year. Right. All right. Is, is it? Yeah. Oh, you, is it time? Is that what we have to convince you again, Nick? All right. Last two. Well, yeah. I can tell you to bring my clipboard right now. All right. All right. <laughs> so, LeBron James, right? Really good basketball player. He likes to dribble the ball up and down the court. Um, <laughs> I think losing Kyrie Irving and just the, the type of – storyline that the Cavaliers are building to right now, I might just be buying into the Cavs a little bit too much. Not that I think they won it all this year, because I, I don't think they do. But um, he, um, everyone has called him obsessed while he's working out. He looks more driven than he has in recent memory. He seems more hungry than he has. LeBron's 32. He really only has peak form for maybe one, two years at best, unless he is a superhuman and Father Time doesn't catch him. Uh but this is probably his last best chance, I think, to win an MVP. If he wants to win another one, this is probably his best chance. I'm not saying that he play every game this year because I don't. I think he still takes eight days off. Or, or you can't anymore, can you? Or no, whatever, whatever the case is. Whatever the case is, you know, if he only plays one half. Um, because of the pieces around him, his assist numbers will go up. I don't think his rebounding numbers will drop because he'll probably be playing more power forward than he has in recent memory. And then offensively, I mean, on this team, they may not match up great with the Golden State Warriors, but when you're playing out east, there are still a lot of weapons for this Cavaliers team. Um, and I think it still does make LeBron's job a little bit easier. Yes, he gets to beat up on the Eastern Conference and the Eastern Conference teams majority of the season, which also will bolster his numbers. But I mean, man, if everything holds true, I just think this is just one of those years where LeBron James just reminds everyone, you know, that he's still the greatest player on the planet and walks the Cavs into the finals. Yeah, just to build off what Corey said, uh, I'll, I'll kind of add a few few points uh, that I think kind of help your argument. But, I mean, most of what you said is the reason why I picked the guy as well. Um, I think this season the team is, is deeper, I, and I think that helps them – in those games that LeBron is going to miss. And one of the reasons that – or one of the things that, that uh, people held against LeBron in the race last season was 
the fact that the Cavaliers didn't win enough games. And a big a big problem is that with that is that you know the team is like one in six when he sits, right? Uh, they lose a lot of games if he doesn't play. I think this season when he doesn't play, I think uh, as much of their advantage, I think they'll be able to win a few more games. So their record will look a lot better than it did last season. I also think LeBron kind of recognizes that with their current roster, there's not a great chance that they win an NBA championship. They're by far um, the best team in the Eastern Conference, but have much of a chance against Golden State. And I, I think that most people see it that way. So I'm just trying to look at it from my if, – if I was LeBron James, what I would be doing this season. And I think for him – the, you know, in terms of his legacy, the best thing for him to do is get that fifth MVP, tie Michael Jordan's number. I think you know that's a that's a number that is not obviously not as important as the championship number, but it's still the number that people are going to look to and say, well, you know what, you know, he didn't get as many championships, but he didn't get as enough, you know, as many regular season MVPs either. So I think he should not worry so much about the championship this season. Go after that fifth MVP. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why he's going to end up walking away with his fifth and probably final award. So my thing with LeBron is that he can win MVP whenever he wants. If he really is motivated to do it, he can prove that he's the best basketball player in the world, which, I mean, I think the the vast majority of people in the media, people who are in our position will say that LeBron remains the best player in the world. Uh, I'm just not fully there that he's not going to coast through the playoff or coast through the regular season because we've seen each of the last couple of years that they don't care about uh, playoff seating or anything like that. And, and with a weak um, Eastern conference toward the bottom um, and with plenty of questions, for the other contenders in the Eastern Conference, I don't see a reason other than spite toward Kyrie why LeBron would really need to. I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I see the legacy thing with, with Jordan uh, in terms of trying to tie him. Uh, I just think that uh, all the focus is going to be on the Western Conference this year and in the race. And if the Spurs can keep a decent pace with the Warriors, with all the deficiencies that San Antonio has, starting at point guard, uh, with a disgruntled LaMarcus Aldridge, with Rudy Gay uh, kind of being their pseudo third best player now, um, it's time to value both sides of the basketball with uh, the MVP voting the same way I said uh, about sixth man and if you look at the results from last year Russell Westbrook and James Harden who are one and two those guys have more mouths to feed in their respective places uh, and then Isaiah Thomas who is fifth he's going to miss half the season so I don't think he'll be in the running or anything like that to me uh, Kawhi is the engine that makes the Spurs go and if they if they're able to stay within um, you know, distance with, with the Warriors, then I think you have to you have to look at Kawhi and see how valuable he is to San Antonio if they remain ahead of Houston, ahead of Oklahoma City with the adjustments that they've made. Uh, Kawhi was sixth in offensive win shares, sixth in defensive win shares last season. West, Russell Westbrook was the only other player in the top ten in both categories, and I just think uh, that balance and that variance that that he brings to both sides of the ball is just so incredibly valuable. And uh, watching Leonard before he went down in the playoffs last season, I thought his passing skills, his playmaking skills were on full display toward the end, the second half of last season. And I think um, he has uh, uh, a lot of opportunity to grow that part of his game. Uh, I think I read somewhere that we haven't had an MVP and uh, something like 10 – for 12 years, who hasn't averaged more than five assists per game. So I think Leonard can get up to that level. Uh, he had a career high in assists multiple times in the playoffs last year, and he's just becoming a brilliant playmaker, in my opinion. And uh, even though San Antonio is, is sort of kind of an off-the-radar small market team, I think people finally realize just how great this guy is. Well, these definitely be my top two choices right here. I mean, like you said, LeBron, he's definitely going to have a little extra juice this year. Kawhi, the Spurs just need him. You know, there's not really an option anymore for Kawhi not to be amazing. Like you said, he definitely improved in some aspects, definitely in the passing too. And LeBron, you know, Kyrie's not going to be there, so he's going to have to play make a little bit more. Like I have with the LeBron argument, I just don't see LeBron in his head being like, you know what, I'm not going to go for the finals aren't important to me this year. I'm going to go more for the MVP because you think about it this way, the Warriors knock on wood, you know, somebody tears their ACL or breaks their ankle or something, have a shot. 
fully healthy, yeah, they don't have a shot probably. But if they're, you know, the Warriors are banged up, there's a chance. And we mentioned, I think, on another pod, the Warriors can be pretty gassed by the time they hit the finals if they have to go through, you know, hypothetically San Antonio, OKC, and Houston. It would probably be the thing. And I think LeBron, having the deeper roster this year, he's not going to have to play as many minutes and produce as much with Kawhi. I think Kawhi is going to win this year. And I think it's amazing for the Spurs to remain in the top of the West. Can I, if, can I just give my my runner up real quick? That the the my I'm gonna yeah. give my dark horse for the MVP race. Y- uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Oh yeah, for okay. me, he's gonna win one at some point. Race. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna have at least two or three by the time his career is over. I think. Yeah, but I think he's the guy to watch out for this year in the East, especially because you know, as you guys mentioned, the West is so stacked. I think the East can make stronger cases because their stats will be so. Uh, you know, just so in your face, like eye popping. But definitely keep an eye on that MVP race. Just, I'm going to run through everything real quick. We're going to go through uh, everybody's picks. So, rookie of the year, Corey had uh, Dennis Smith Jr., Jonathan had Lonzo Bell, oh, Lonzo Bell, Lonzo Ball, Matt had Dennis Smith Jr. as well. I had Ben Simmons, most improved player. Corey had Miles Turner, Jonathan had Joseph Nurkage, Matt had Gary Harris Jr., I had D'Angelo Russell. Sixth man of the year, Corey had Derrick Rose, Jonathan had Lou Williams. Matt had Andre Guadala. I also had Lou Williams. All three of you went with Rudy Gobert, and I went with Draymond Green. Coach of the year, Corey, Jonathan, Eric Spolstra, Matt, Brad Stevens, and myself, Billy Donovan. Ron for Corey and Jonathan. MVP, Kawhi for Matt and I. That wraps it up for our award show. Great, great debate, guys. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you guys for taking the time to do this. And be sure to check out the NBA outlet and on the rest of our pods all season long. Make sure to nominate us for podcast of the year. Yeah. <laughs>